Now, I'm very aware of what you're expecting. We are cynical who? We are cynics in real life. And we're talking today about Warriors of the Deep, one of the most hated Doctor Who stories ever, and, as others have argued, probably the one story that did more than any other to cement Doctor Who's status in the public consciousness as a joke of a show with terrible production values for which cancellation would be a blessing. Michael Grade, the controller of BBC One who attempted to cancel the show a year after the story went out, went on to Room 101 in 2002 to moan about how much he hated the show and couldn't understand its appeal. And what footage did he use to justify his opinion? It was of course footage from this very story, which was screened to huge laughs of derision from the Room 101 audience. <laughs> I rest my case. I really do. You would perhaps expect me then to really tear into this story, to send it scurrying to Tenny Hell, rub my hands clean, and end this rather quickly. And you'd be right. Sort of. Uh, but it probably speaks volumes about my own psyche and mental health when I say that things aren't quite that simple. The thing is, this was my introduction to Classic Who, one of the first pre-2005 stories I properly watched. So, it was interesting from a nostalgic point of view to see what Classic Who was like. And also, I was about 10 or 11 at the time. And you may know what it's like at that age, you haven't yet developed any critical faculties, and you just think almost everything is good by default. Both of these factors impacted the way I viewed the story when I first saw it. And, as a result, they went on to affect how I viewed the story for a very long time afterwards. It was only many years later that idly drifting through Doctor Who fan sites and online reviews that I noticed just how bad this story's reputation was. Of course, I now concede that many reviewers have made valid points against this story. The new Silurian designs are a bit meh, and the ways in which their third eyes are used leave a lot to be desired. Actually, they're not really used, they're they just flash whenever the character is speaking, a bit like getting a brand new car for your birthday and becoming distracted by the onboard mood lighting or the way the boot opens. Dr. Solau's karate chop movements as she faces the murka make no sense, and the plot relies on foreknowledge of past Silurian stories from 10 years before the story was transmitted. And, oh yes, the murka. The murka is the most notorious aspect of this story's production values, which says a lot considering it's probably not even the worst looking part of the show. I mean honestly, what about the cutting device in part 2, which is more obviously made of papier-mâché than a murka, and looks for no apparent reason like a bloated spring onion. But even with the complaints about the aesthetic of the show, I still gave the show a free ride at the time because, well, it's all well and good for people like Michael Gray to publicly criticise Doctor Who using footage from an outlier within the Doctor Who catalogue. But please, if you're going to use Warriors of the Deep as evidence, can you please acknowledge that that particular production was beset with problems, most of which were not the fault of the team working on that show. Warriors of the Deep lost two weeks from its production schedule before work had even started, because Her Majesty Margaret Thatcher called a snap election completely out of the blue, resulting in BBC Studio Space being reprioritised to cover said election. Pretty much all the rehearsal time the actors would have normally had was thrown out the window. It's easy to mock the bad acting here, but only the most talented, world-class actors would be able to nail a scene in one take, as was often required in this case. Of course, this also meant that important sets and costumes had to be completed in a rush so that they would be ready on time. The Merkur's costume's paint was still wet, and the actors inside it had no time to rehearse because it was completed with just an hour to spare. One could criticise the production team for cutting down on time in these crucial areas as opposed to others, because this killed the show to even any old non-cynical pair of eyes. But really, where else could the production team have saved the time that they needed to? Come on! The circumstances that prevented this story from getting the further refinement it needed were beyond the control of the people in charge. 
except that karate chop, of course. But no mention of this on Room 101. No, just a straw man argument made using carefully selected snippets that certainly look silly out of context, but simply aren't representative of a show that ran for 26 years and was about so much more than the odd inevitable misstep. I know Grades changed his mind on the show since it was revived, and that's great, really, but his attitude to the show that you see on Room 101, an attitude he held for many years, it really annoys me. Of course it would, what with me being a fan and all, but if he was so irritated by the poor production values on Doctor Who compared to the effects in Star Wars and Star Trek, as he says, why didn't he just, I don't know, use his power to increase the budget Doctor Who had so that it would have been able to compete? Is that, is that a silly proposition, or...? So, when I saw the reviews for this story, I thought, Okay, so the production values are poor, but there's a good story if you're prepared to look for it, and it's a fun ride. I enjoyed it when I was a kid after all. But then I actually re-watched the darn thing for this review, and unfortunately, even accepting and eliminating the production problems, the script is flawed and rather frustrating. There are some great moments. I particularly liked Maddox laying bare his doubts in part one, but there are also a fair few bits of clunky dialogue, particularly for the Silurians, as well as some obvious contrivances, such as characters hiding and not being found despite the fact they could have easily been found, and that whole bit of pointless banter with Sentinel-6 at the start, which I think was supposed to explain how the Doctor turned up in the sea base, but still doesn't stop it from feeling like a neat coincidence. As the Doctor Who Classic Series website once pointed out, when he's actually arrived at the sea base, there's no evidence that anything's going wrong, so... Why don't they just materialise away the moment they materialise on that sea base? In addition, there are clearly some good ideas with a lot of promise that just end up being glossed over. Uh, for instance, the Cold War style hostility between two power blocks ready and waiting to wipe each other out. That feels like it should have been a crucial element. Instead, it becomes mere window dressing to a main plot about Silurian invasion that feels overly simplistic and uninteresting. A main plot that unfolds too slowly, but then seemingly ends too abruptly. And a main plot that relies too much on outer context, wasted on any young or casual viewer. But I think these details would have been less obvious if the direction had been a bit more... exciting. It's amazing how a good director can paper over a lot of cracks. See Lindsay Anderson's 1982 film Britannia Hospital. As Monty Python member Graham Chapman pointed out at the time, when he'd originally received the script, it had seemed dull and heavy-handed, yet he conceded that the finished film is something very captivating indeed. Would Ridley Scott's Alien have been as iconic and effective without his subversive treatment? It would have just been the typical alien horror film of little interest or value if it weren't for the direction. In this case, the main issue lies with the fact that Pennant Roberts was the signed director. He directed Doctor Who series in the past, such as the acclaimed Douglas Adams story The Pirate Planet, along with episodes of Blake 7, so clearly he was accustomed to directing science fiction. But he was no Graham Harper or Peter Grimwade. This is just my theory, but I think he was unprepared for all the production problems, which led him to direct the serial in a very workmanlike way. I haven't seen any other of his prior works, but here it looks as though he's just trying to finish the job on time and move on, without focusing too much on the story or actor's performances. Notice how actors move around the set unnaturally throughout the whole story. It's treated like an ephemeral multi-camera soap opera. There's seemingly no passion or interest in what the story's about. At least that's how it seems to my eyes. It's very easy to feel utter boredom during the second half of the story, even despite the aforementioned potential of the script. Eric Saywood's contributions to script editor really didn't help matters either. I normally don't mind his approach, but this is a very good example of his tendencies towards violent nihilism actively sabotaging the story just as effectively as Nilsson and Maddox sabotaged the base. Too many characters get killed off. Vorshak and Preston stayed alive in the original draft, and their deaths do not add anything. The resolution of the Silurians being killed off using hexachromite gas... Well, that could have been decent and effective, but it's just a muddled mess. When a sea devil is killed with the gas, Preston pulls a face, but then barely 30 seconds later, she passionately advocates for its use to kill the whole squad. That said, in the script, the Doctor does clearly try to avoid their deaths. He gives the Sinuans a chance to leave, and is ultimately left powerless by circumstances around him. But should the Doctor lack authority and power? 
the, the whole thing just feels too depressing and unwarranted. So, in summary then, oh, I don't know. I really don't. Clearly the production is highly flawed, but certainly that was not the entire fault of the production team, by which I mean the props men and the designers who are harmlessly trying to do their best with little time and support, and they barely got little of either at the best of times. Of course, it's difficult to tell how much better things would have been if circumstances were different. There are bad effects in other Doctor Who stories, but none are quite as infamous as the Merca, a direct result of the truncated schedule, so maybe things wouldn't have been too bad, but the biggest problem with Warriors of the Deep is its mediocre direction, completely devoid of any zest or enthusiasm, both a result of the show's predicament thanks to Mrs. Thatcher and the way in which it was slowly being taken over by people who merely looked down upon it as just another job rather than raising their standards. But as much as I really want to defend the script and highlight its potential in spite of the poor execution, clearly there are problems. Plot holes, unnatural dialogue, unnatural characters, themes and character journeys that are explored with all the deafness of a car skidding through a safari park and running over the animals it's supposed to be observing. But most of the problems were not addressed by the script editor, even though ironing out such flaws was his bloody job. <sighs> it took me around 10 years to realise it. I want to like this, rationalise this, say that its position as a joke is unwarranted, but I can't. I can't! Even popping my brain out, suspending my disbelief and looking past the dated aesthetic, watching it made me feel confused and frankly rather depressed. The hatred is justified. Warriors of the Deep is perfect. That is, in the sense that it's a perfect example of everything that was wrong with the show in the mid-80s. It's not even enjoyable on a so bad it's good level like some other stories from the time. It's just boring. Did it need to be so tonally unsure of itself? So dark? So morally garbled? So... So terrible? God, I, I really hate having to stick with the crowd. and I, I, I would love to state a different opinion because I know that stuff does better on YouTube and is more interesting but I'm sorry I'm gonna have to side with the crowd for once. Good night. <laughs>